Today, we plan to have a panel discussion, and our panelists today are uh, Jeremy Stratton-Smith, lead developer Wolfram Alpha Math Content, Jason Sonnenberg, lead developer for Chemistry Education, Wolfram Alpha Scientific Content, Michael Trott, executive chief scientist, Wolfram Alpha Scientific Content, and Christopher Wolfram, technical lead R&D special projects from the Wolfram Research Team. Throughout the week, we have collected questions from our attendees, and uh, we've shortlisted some of the interesting questions that we believe everybody will benefit from. And uh, we have requested our panelists to have a discussion on these questions. Um, Jason uh, will be uh, will ha has graciously agreed to be the panel moderator today. Um, during this. We, we have talked about a number of different LLM offerings and functionality from Wolfram, and we are curious to know which of these are of most interest to you. Thank you for sharing your responses. Uh, they look great, a lot of interest in the Wolfram plugin for ChatGPT and in the uh, LLM webinars and um, a fair amount of interest in uh, the development kit, the ChatGPT plugin kit. Um, and, and the other options for working with ChatGPT and other language models from within Wolfram Language, Wolfram Notebook environment. All right, so I am going to now hand things over to Jason so we can get started with our panel discussion. Thank you. We'd like to start with a question from John. And that question was, do I see ChatGPT with Wolfram plugin sometimes using Wolfram Alpha and other times, quite appropriately, using Wolfram? Is the resource behind using Wolfram an existing commercial or licensed service? I got the tech specs docs licensing for that resource, or is it embedded in or around Wolfram Alpha? And I think Jeremy has an answer for this question. Yeah, thanks, Jason. So um, this is a this is a great question because through, throughout this week we have certainly shown a lot of various uh, various kinds of results that you can get um, from the Wolfram plugin in ChatGPT. And the, the question to the first, the, the, the answer to the first question there is, is yes. Uh, it is sometimes using Wolfram Alpha and it's sometimes using Wolfram language, um, both of which are, they're making API calls in the background. Um, for uh, be, being a Wolfram Alpha person, um, I am gonna put a link in the chat for folks who are interested. Um, we have a number of, uh, APIs available as separate products, um, and you can uh, get started for free with that um, if you are a developer who's wanting to be able to, to, to do that kind of thing um, in your own product. But from within Wolfram Alpha, uh, from within ChatGPT, um, ChatGPT has, has done a little bit of learning to know what kinds of things uh, you know it can send. What what kinds of inputs do we think that it'll be able to do well with? Wolfram Alpha, and what kinds of things do we does it think it's going to have to send to the Wolfram language, where it's going to be, have to be evaluating some code? Um, as as we've seen throughout this week, when it makes the call to Wolfram um, to, through the Wolfram public plugin, you are able to open the the little bubble that shows up, and um, essentially based on what you see in that bubble, you can tell if it's writing code, then it's getting sent to the Wolfram Cloud. If it's writing um, more of a textual or just natural language input, that is something that's going to Wolfram Alpha. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully that answers that. And um, particularly for the Wolfram Alpha part, yeah, I would encourage you to, to check out our page on the existing Wolfram Alpha APIs. Great. We had a question from Hakan. What I understand there is an initial hidden from the user and probably quite long major prompt that is given by the plugin to chat GPT for each session. Can you describe that initial prompt, for example, what it contains? And the answer is yes. And so it is the public manifest that's on our website and I'll stop sharing and switch over to it so we can all look at it. There we go. So this is the live manifest. And yes, it is a, a bit long. And so as you can see, it talks about version. And then here it is, the description. This is the, 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 the input uh, prompt that goes to um, 
ChatGPT when the R plugin is loaded. So you can see how it is. Um, you may want to cut and paste it out into a different text editor to you know, take care of the line wrapping uh, or put it into a notebook and modify it. But that's, that's where it is. And this gets updated from time to time. Uh, there is a question about, can you describe the initial prompt, for example? Um, as you can see, I, I won't read this to you, but I'll let you read it yourself. Basically, we tell it what we provide, how to give us queries, um, and then some other issues of you know how to interact with the plugin and how to you know compose good Wolfram language code, good Wolfram Alpha queries, and so on. The next question was from Jason, not me, and it was two parts. Uh, first part was interacting code using the prompt, including asking the model to write out its final Wolfram language code, and prompt engineering to help this work better. Any tips on handling errors along the way, cutoffs from outputs that are too long, and retries? And the second part was meta prompts that direct ChatGPT to perform a sequence of operations. What works, and is there anything that doesn't? And I think Michael had some insight into this. And Michael, do you need to share the screen? Yep, let me share my screen. I have a couple of things I want to show. Overall, there isn't really one thing that fits everything. There is a lot of things one can do, and uh, let's describe a few of them. Here should be... Repeat some of the things I quickly went over in my Wednesday session. My experience is the better you describe to ChatGTP what you want to happen, the better ChatGTP behaves. And basically, your prompt can easily be maybe 15 lines to really tell ChatGTP what you expect. You expect uh, to say, first, write the code, write the code properly, comment it, use a certain coding style. You want certain subroutines explicitly rather than one big module that you might have to take apart yourself for debugging. You want certain functions to use. You want certain functions not to use. You want certain functions to be restricted to certain argument patterns. Really be, be as detailed as you can be and tell it what to do if there is an error when you run it, go back, or all such things. And here are two things that I use frequently that, in my opinion, work very well for me, and I will show some examples in a moment. I always like to see the code first written before it sends it for any evaluation. And the evaluation you need so that it can make sure that the code really works. Because in the little box calling Wolfram, if you open this, there the code is a little bit unreadable because new line characters are slash n, so it's not a particularly nice formatting. But if you ask it to nicely format it, then I think it does do a much better job. So let's look at a couple of examples. So here I say, I want the graphic of the Hofstadter butterfly. And it does do an amazing job. Suddenly, magically, here's the Hofstadter butterfly. And then you can open this and yeah, it's a little bit possible to read, but it's not my favorite indentation style. So it makes a max flux and then it makes uh, a matrix where it looks through and it's sparse matrix and then it calculates the eigenvalues and makes this. Let's take a slightly different example. Uh, like I want to do the following, here's my little task. I want to place a circle between the curves plus minus cosine x squared. And I could just have started with this and I would have gotten something similar to what I just had, but I wouldn't quite see what really happened. So I really tell it, do this, develop first the code, write the code, and then run it. And then it starts and it gives me the first part, which I can easily understand and I see what happens. And then it does it. It doesn't do it quite right, which is also interesting. And that's why I showed it. So it makes a picture and it showed, obviously, the circle does not fit between the blue and the green curve. And this is something that I frequently observe. But ChatGDP is pretty decent in writing code. It, it has relatively poor 2D and spatial understanding of things. And if we look at it, we know it is irrelevant how far this point is from the origin. It is relevant how far the nearest point is to the origin. So I give it as a hint, uh, you didn't do the quite right thing. You want to look for something else. And then it writes better code. And this gives now the correct radius. And now it fits perfect. Or another example, you could just say, 
I want, uh, actually this one, I want to make a Riemann sum approximation for the integral of sine x between zero and pi. And uh, it, it does something, I do not really know what it does, and then something went wrong, but it gives me by the end of the day a right result. So I could go in and then carefully check what, why, oh, it actually used a concrete number of a Riemann sum. That's actually not what I want. So what you probably want is a much more elaborate prompt, something like this one, where again, I say, develop the code, write it down, make sure it's properly formatted, evaluate it. And then I break really down in great detail what I wanted to do. Make the Riemann sum, here are my steps. Subdivide the interval. I don't give it any code to do, but just conceptual. Then kind of assume insight, then do the symbolic form, make a large expansion, derive where the leading term vanishes, and then give me the result. And I think it does do an excellent job following my instructions going down, making the pieces, gives me the result, and then one more time summarizes it, and then I can follow on and say, do some more serious expansion to get an asymptotic term. So in summary, as detailed as you can be, the better, and tell it really with respect to code and everything what it wanted to do, and it will, in most cases, be quite obedient. Sometimes after maybe the fifth uh, back and forth, you might have reminded on something because I've forgotten certain things you wanted, but overall it is a pretty obedient child. Thanks, Michael. That, that's very helpful. The next question came from Wayne and it was prompts and templates for streamlined communication between ChatGPT and Wolfram, Al Wolfram Alpha. Thank you. So Christopher, could you uh, expound on that a bit? Right, so uh, let me see. So there are several different kind of uh, prompts and things that we, we showed in this, uh, you know, this uh, this last week. So I mean, certainly in the recordings and so on, you can you can find a lot of those. Um, also in the the blog post on the um, Stephen Wolfram's blog, I think there were lots of examples. Um, otherwise, uh, I mean, we've been doing some experiments and thinking about ways of sort of uh, of uh, you know collecting lots of different prompts for lots of different purposes, but I don't think uh, I don't think we've really released anything as of yet. So uh, yeah, there, there may be more on that in the future. The next question came from Amy. It would be nice to offer a summary of the week by cross-cutting topics like checking correctness or hallucinations or prompt strategies for different areas. So here on the notebook for this uh, study group. Uh, we have lists of the resources, um, summaries of the question and answers, and links. In this case, <laughs> I was linking to um, my notebook. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is the place that I would direct you to get those cross-cutting um, topical examples and, and prompt strategies. Um, I can go on to share some of the examples that I was actually working with yesterday uh, in the realm of chemistry that I think pretty nifty and might uh, expound a little bit on Amy's uh, original question. So as a chemist, I've been interested in using some of the newer functionalities in Wolfram language, particularly the way that we can represent functional groups, which are chunks of molecules uh, inside of the Wolfram language. And so this is relatively new code, uh, but it can be a little little tedious to type in by hand. And so I wanted to see if the chat GPT could help with that. And so here's an example of a prompt uh, that's pretty short, but uh, does quite a lot of work. So let me just walk you through it because it, it shows a sort of strategy that I found to be quite useful in this case to help me write code. Um, there are other ways to get uh, functional groups inside of the language, but you know, Again, I wanted to use ChatGPT here as a coding assistant for my sort of day-to-day -day task. So I tell it to read in the usage statement for two functions that I want it to use. Now, again, these are new, so the, the training data doesn't have much information about it. That's why I had to read it in. Then I said, okay, then write, but don't run code to create an association of functional groups where the keys are the group name and the values are the corresponding molecular pattern for each. 
When building the molecule pattern, objects do not use SMARTS patterns. This is a particular type of string formulation uh, that exists in the chemistry field. And represent the halogens, those are a particular row of elements to the right of the periodic table, with an alternatives, which is a part of our language, rather than just the generic symbol X, which is often seen in the literature and on the web. And then I give it an explicit list of the functional groups that I want it to create these molecule patterns for. And with just this, uh, what the um, ChatGPT does is it goes out and it reads in, <clears throat> excuse me, information about how to use molecule pattern, gets that back, and it uh, takes it in. Also, how to use the bond information, and it spits some of that back out just to say that it, it was um, using it. And then it goes and starts writing the code that I actually want and didn't want to type myself. It builds an alternatives list for the halogens. And so these are the common halogen elements. And then it starts writing the molecule patterns. And so you can see, these are non-trivial. Some of the first ones here are kind of simple, uh, but when you start to get down further, um, these, these are complicated. And what's interesting is that the ChatGPT is bringing its knowledge of chemistry about each of these functional groups and then translating it into the syntax for the code. Now it had a little problem here and it didn't get the pretty highlighting right, uh, but the code that is highlighted nicely and here can be cut and pasted and used right away in the language and I have. So that's one example of sort of a, you know, prompt strategies um, I will say that it took me a little while to get here. I went through a variety of iterations of, you know, figuring out what should be here. Um, now, the question is whether or not that time was um, less than what it would be for me to type this out on my own, but uh, who knows. The other case is I was trying to get, sorry for the scrolling. Um, there was another thing that I was working on yesterday. I wanted to do it to help me with some synthetic chemistry and building up the representation of that. And again, here, I built a uh, long prompt where basically in, where all the white spaces is where if we were doing this in a back and forth, um, I would guide it through the individual steps. But I wanted to see if it could do the whole thing at once, which it did. And what was pretty nifty is in the prompt here, I give it, you know, make sure this, this atom mapping has this form, make sure that you, um, your order for this arguments uh, match the pattern. Uh, here are some common mistakes, don't make those, um, and something else. And so it reads that in, it does, it makes a mistake. And here's what's really nifty is it's getting some error messages back from the plugin and the bot is using that to figure out what it needs to do next. Here it figured out it had three things left to do and it corrected its own code. And then here we go. It, it didn't do, it screwed up a little bit on the chemistry because it didn't have the molecule that I wanted, but it was able to um, fix the code, get output, and then present it back to me. And here we have taken a molecule and run a reaction on it, um, breaking a double bond and, and substituting a bromine. It started with, a diff, like I said, it started with 1,3-hexadiene rather than 1,4, but it's doing it. And so that's pretty significant. So I, I'll stop there and move on to our next question from Paul that Mike and Christopher will answer. And it's writing Wolfram language modules and full applications. Also, could ChatGPT curate data for Wolfram language data sets? All right, so maybe I can, I can start by answering uh, maybe a bit of the first part there. So um, uh, we've been doing some experiments with uh, basically using more plugins to give it access to, to give ChatGPT access to, uh, to sort of more features it needs to write larger pieces of code. So just using the Wolfram plugin, it can basically write anything that can fit into a single call to the plugin and it can run that. But if you wanna be able to say, develop a whole packlet, then uh, you know it needs to be able to edit files and read files and and stuff like this and generally manage a code base that's bigger than its context size. So I'm gonna paste maybe in the chat here, a link to um, some of the experiments using uh, the ChatGPT plugin kit, which is the packlet for making your own ChatGPT plugins. And in that example, there's um, 
there's a there's a plugin that basically lets uh, basically gives ChatGPT the ability to write edit files and uh, and read them back and and so on and reload and test Hacklets. Um, and so using that, it can make it can make more significant. Uh, it can probably make more significant programs. I think so far I've mostly tried it just with editing existing packlets, existing code bases. Because so I think one of the easier cases is something like uh, given you have a big code base and a bug report, can you fix or at least identify the bug? But I'm sure that workflows like that will at least eventually work for for developing you know code bases from from nothing. So uh, yeah, I think it's it's quite an interesting area. Okay, uh, and I have been playing around with how ChatGTP can help make curate improve data sets. And there's definitely some potential. Let me share again my screen. Okay, so there are this, uh, I am quite fascinated by them and Jason, my chemist on board will probably agree, things like this Cubane, which are this highly symmetric 3D cage-like carbon things or dodecahedrine. And uh, so I was saying to ChatGTP, hey, make me a data set out of them. And uh, I want as much as you can get. And it made a bunch of them. It told me their formula, when they were synthesized the first time, who did it, uh, what kind of symmetry group they have. And it is, I would say, a little bit lazy in the sense of it will give you typically five things and maybe five properties that it ends. But if you coach it saying, I need XT15 and I need 12 properties, you can get it actually to do quite a bit more work. And uh, because ChatGDP has been trained on all kinds of things on the internet that we don't have in our Wolfram knowledge database, you can ask it exotic things like give me the trending hair colors between 2010 and 2020, who were the leading producers, uh, were they male, female, how much do they cost and such things. Or here is a data set that I first wrote in ChatGTP. I asked it, make me a data set of uh, important Bavarian monasteries. When were they built? How many monks are there right now? What do they produce? Mostly produce beer, it's not unexpected for Bavaria. Uh, what's important about them? What are nearby rivers? And it does do a good job. And then I take the data set in a totally new session and say, hey, here's a data set that I got from somewhere. And I want you to review it. Uh, I see. Is this one? Mm, no, yeah, this one. And then I say, I want you to review it. And then it writes a review, say, that's pretty OK. Uh, some things might verification. And you could add a couple of things. So it is pretty good. But you could also use it, say, for point fixes. Like, uh, say you work on material data and brass uh, material that doesn't have a very well-defined composition because you can change how much of copper zinc go in. And I say, I need the, uh, say, electrical conductivity at room temperature. And then it will say, yeah, here are a couple of values that I know from somewhere. And then you say, oh, I need a couple more. And then it will give you some more. And for especially for really collecting data, ChatGTP is not bad, but you might be better off using the tools that Christopher had described and call GDP4 because GDP4 has a much better knowledge about the world because it was trained on much more. And it can give you also some references where it got this data. And I recommend checking it uh, because sometimes, as we know, a reference is hallucinated and doesn't exist in real. But it is definitely a useful tool to, to get started on things. We had another question from Monique. Will ChatGPT, or can it, help us write plugins for Wolfram? Um, Christopher, would you mind uh, sharing your thoughts on that? Sure, sure. It's a, it's a, it's a good question. So uh, I haven't tried it. But I have to imagine that it, it should be able to do it with some documentation, of course. So, so the problem usually is that uh, you know, the, the model itself has only been trained on data up till sometime in 2021 or so. And so um, that means it doesn't know about chat GPT plugins because they didn't exist when its training data was collected. Um, 
that can often be fixed by giving it access to documentation. So, um, you know, and we, we saw some examples of that, I think yesterday even. Um, so I think uh, an interesting experiment would be to, to basically take the documentation from ChatGPT plugin kit, give it to ChatGPT, and then ask it to, to write a plugin. I have to imagine it would, it shouldn't have really any trouble at all because, you know, you can make, you know, basic plugins are usually just like a few lines of code. And so it's, it, it should have no problem with it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a really, a really great idea. Christopher, the next question is also up your alley. Uh, Lydia asks, I'm interested in how ChatGPT could help us use Mathematica better as a comparison for choosing the most appropriate functions or instructions in Mathematica for a given task. Yeah, so there's maybe a few things here. So uh, the first thing is we've been doing some experiments with essentially using uh, ChatGPT or LLMs more generally to do basically what's like a better version of documentation search, but it's, you know, of course can do more than search. So for example, you know, right now, if you, if you want to say, you know, let's say you have like a task, like, oh, I want to take some list and I want to split it into equal pieces, right? Or like, I want to split it into chunks of size three, let's say. So that's a job, like there's a function called partition that does that in, in Wolfram language. But let's say you don't know, you don't know that function exists. So the idea is that there are, you know, LLMs, especially if they've read the docs, can know about these sorts of things. Um, and so you could imagine asking them a kind of more natural language question that might not include the word partition anywhere and just sort of describes your task. And then it can, it can give you back a list of sort of functions that, that can do that. You can already, if you just ask ChatGPT for a list of Wolfram language functions that would be useful for you know, some task, it can often answer, although of course it, it has some gaps and doesn't know about the newest stuff. But, um, but certainly, uh, you know, these are sort of engineering problems that, that, that are often solvable. So um, yeah, that's something we're looking at. Another thing is, um, uh, this is sort of very, some of this is very recent stuff, but there's some, uh, there's some experiments that we've been working on for essentially integrating chat GPT into uh, sort of into the notebook environment in a way that you know so that you can sort of get help programming just anywhere, not not in ChatGPT or or anything. So um, one of the early versions of this is um, I just posted a link in the chat to a function repository entry from uh, Rick Hennigan um, that shows sort of a, an early version of that where you see you can you can basically uh, talk to ChatGPT within a notebook and then you can even get it sort of commentary on your code. Or for example, if, uh, if you ran something and it produced messages, so like it didn't run correctly, then uh, it'll, <clears throat> excuse me, it'll feed the code to ChatGPT and then it will sort of give you commentary on, on why might this, uh, why might it have behaved in this way. Um, there's also some, some even newer stuff that sort of like, this is really, this is really, cutting edge. So, I mean, this was, uh, I think released just maybe last night or something, and it's all very, uh, you know, in flux, but there's another packlet, um, that's sort of the, in, in some ways, the updated version of this, um, called the chat chat book is the tentative name of the packlet, which is in the, the official packlet repository. Um, so, uh, that would be another place to look. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot, a lot of experiments going on there. That's all very exciting. Thank you for uh, enlightening us about that. The next question comes from Ray. And he's, he asks, in what ways have expert internal Wolfram Mathematica developers used ChatGPT and the plugins to assist in their daily jobs? What are the most interesting aspects of some of their favorite examples? As I was uh, sharing uh, earlier, um, that was an example of using ChatGPT to basically write code for functional groups that I didn't want to sit and type myself. Um, I can also uh, share out that I've been developing some new functions for uh, hopefully system functions for stoichiometry and chemical solutions. And what I found ChatGPT to be particularly useful for is as a way to, if you will, pull the collective internet 
um, because it was trained on a lot of information from existing websites, um, it does represent sort of what collectively uh, the internet community would think to put something together. So I'll often do the sort of workflow where I am coding up, uh, I, I build a structure for the new function and I'm worried about, well, is this argument list, should it be this way, should it be this way, should, should I have an option, should I, you know, change different features or down values. And what I'll do is then I'll have, um, I'll ask the chat GPT, if you were using this new function in Wolfram language and you wanted to build code to solve this problem, how would you construct it? And I ask it not to evaluate it, but just show me how it would compose it. And that has been very useful to see um, what other folks might who haven't used the language or are chemists that have some coding knowledge might uh, expect the function to behave. So that's that's been quite helpful. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that I'm not the only one that has been uh, using the, the tool in that way. So our next question comes from James. Integration of Wolfram with ChatGPT and other plugins, workflows, and dependencies. And Brad, unfortunately, is not with us today, but he had some examples of having multiple plugins enabled and doing queries between them. And I think Jeremy was going to refresh us a little bit of what that uh, looked like or you know things that you can do. Right, so I, I remember this question came up earlier on in the week as well. And um, yeah, the, the real, I guess the, the strength of having all of these uh, plugins and I likely there will be more um, as things move along here, is that because it's all all of the plugins are tying back to ChatGPT itself? Um, if you you know they essentially can they can stack on top of each other because they're all providing different kinds of information or different kinds of capabilities to ChatGPT. The ChatGPT is able to juggle those things all together at the same time. So um, one of the examples that Brad showed earlier in the week, I, I believe, was um, or the, we've we've talked about at least is using ChatGPT to start talking about planning a trip using the Expedia plugin. And uh, as part of the results that the Expedia plugin can return, it tells you uh, cost you know, for a flight or cost for a hotel room. Um, and then being able to you know, do the computation right in the notebook uh, and even do some uh, more complicated things like saying, how much does this trip cost per foot traveled or something like that, right? Where we're able to uh, use Wolfram Alpha to get accurate distances between the cities that you're traveling between and uh, possibly also use Wolfram Alpha to be doing, you know, the correct mathematical computation of even just checking how much is the trip in total going to cost. Um, so all of the information that's getting fed back to ChatGPT can can get sent back out to other plugins to be able to, uh, yeah, to, to enrich the experience overall. This last question is, we're going to, uh, from uh, Jesus. And Michael, I'm hoping that you can uh, share some insight. His question is, how about doing some examples in into the area of dynamical systems? Yes, excellent question. And I had tried already some before the question came. Uh, but I hadn't tried the Rösler system, so let's, let's look at it. Uh, so I start with my favorite prompt. If you do anything, first show me the code nicely formatted, then evaluate it, and then go on. And it's always very polite. I can do this. And I say, do you know the Rösler system? So I'm trying to be harmless. I said, yes, here it is. Uh, here it looks. Then I say, OK, let's calculate the fixed points, which is pretty easy. Uh, so it has to solve the system. But the system is nonlinear enough that it cannot do it. So it calls the Wolfram plugin. And it, it uses some concrete parameters that it has probably seen a couple of times in the training phase. So it calculates some numerical values. And, I, it's, uh, and it figures out, it gets a message from solve saying they are in an exact coefficient. So I cannot do an exact job. And it says, OK, then let me rationalize this. Then it makes rational numbers and tries again and says, here are these values. But I say, this is not what I wanted. I wanted it as a symbolic expression in ABC. So it goes back and uh, computes a symbolic expression in ABC. This time, basically, 
the symbolic ones, and it gets this not too complicated and well-known expression. Then I say I would like to see the classical attractor, the two butterfly wings. And it says, OK, I can do this. So it writes this code. It takes some random initial conditions with pretty decent parameters. This one's for the given ones. Uh, writes down the differential equation, solves it, and calls parametric plot. And uh, then it gets a message. Uh, this problem is stiff at around t equal 1 for the chosen initial condition. They say, oh, I should probably use a stiffness switching method that is especially adopted the numerical integration method for stiff systems. So it locks this in again and then says, hey, here, here's the plot I got. Depending on initial condition, you can always get, of course, a slightly different version of the plot. Then I say, okay, uh, let's do a little bit something more non-trivial. What I want you to do is these days, so modern large time expansions. So I make a generic series expansion, x from t is x0. And because it's a first order system, it can recursively plug this in by using the differential equation itself. And uh, it understands this reasonably well. And it makes this code, so it takes the system and then recursively differentiates the system, substitutes initial condition, differentiates the system, substitutes initial conditions, then runs this all, and then gets uh, a decent, something went one time wrong, and then it gets uh, up to t to the four series expansion in the initial conditions and in the parameters. So it can do slightly non-trivial things. And a slightly different example from a 2D discrete system, uh, again, my favorite prompt, what it should do. And I say, here's a recursive map from C2 to C2, where for a given irrational alpha, I want you to form this. And I want to test this function. That is really, you get this right. And then it writes some code. It calculates the cycle, the smallest. And then, then I say, but I don't really like the code. I like the code has a pen do, which we know is not the greatest complexity. And it knows this. You can ask it about the complexity of a pen to, and it figures this out. I should probably not use it. You rewrite it with an array, which is faster. And then it checks that the result is the same what it got earlier. And then I say, OK, now let's do something non-trivial. It use some initial conditions where we get some interesting dynamical system. And it gets correctly the relatively large cycle. And then I say, uh, just uh, show the cycle as a polygon, and it works fine. So it's not that you can take ChatGTP right now and write a paper that you can publish next week in Chaos, but but you it, it does help uh, writing some code, and I feel I find this pretty useful and pretty interesting and unexpected up to three months ago that there would be such a system. Thank you, Michael. That that's very exciting, and I think we're all um, generally a little blown away by by what's been put together both by OpenAI and ourselves and the combination of what you can do when you glue those two technologies together. Thank you so much, Jason, for moderating the discussion. And a big thank you to all our panelists uh, for not only stopping by today, but presenting over the week. We hope our attendees have found this study group useful. The material will be continue uh, will be available to you to all our attendees. The cloud notebooks, the community discussion thread. You have access to the recordings, so please uh, do come back and visit this material. Go over them. We understand the disappointment of not being able to use the plugin right away. Uh, many of you are still in the plugin waitlist, but we do hope in the coming weeks and coming months, as and when the plugins are rolled out more and more people have access to it. You're able to try all these fun examples. Please stay tuned. Keep an eye on the Wolf from You website. Uh, we usually feature our courses and uh, events that are coming up on our website, wolfram.com uh, slash wolfram-u. And we hope to run another uh, iteration of this daily study group uh, a little later in a few weeks or months uh, when people have more access to the plugins, when they are able to try these things on their own. So keep an eye on our website and we hope to see you at a future event uh, once more. Have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you so much for joining our daily study group series.